Welcome to a look ahead. We study the Sabbath school lessons as, as, as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Daniel. And this is lesson number 11 in that series for March 14 of 2020, entitled From Battle to Victory. Hmm, that sounds like an interesting subject. This will be primarily covering Daniel 10, and Daniel 10, as we will discover, is part of the first part of a three-chapter vision, includes Daniel 10, 11, and 12. So we're going to be on this for the rest of the quarter. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now, seeking to understand your will for our lives and understanding these passages from Scripture that are, have so much detail and, and so much careful study required. Be with us now as we work through these materials that we may see the truth shining ever more clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We will focus, as I suggested, on Daniel 10. It introduces that first, that final three-chapter series, 10, Daniel 10, 11, and 12, a single vision. Um, and there is some hint that this vision is about some kind of a great conflict. Um, Dennis, can you tell us something about that? Yes, I'll read uh, Daniel 10, 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the message was true and the one and one of great conflict, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. And that's New American Standard Bible. So I chose the New American Standard Bible and for that verse specifically because it points out those terms, great conflict. So where are the greatest battles in the universe being fought? In your mind. Woo! Wow. How are we involved? Satan is no longer able to harass beings in the rest of the universe because his motives and his methods have been uncovered and the beings of the rest of the universe see the devil for who he really is. His fight now is only over our minds and our thoughts. When we turn our minds to God and study God's word or pray, we are entering a cosmic conflict. But as we know, that conflict has two sides. Will we join Jesus and his side, or will we join Satan and his side? That's the challenge. Can we describe, can you describe, this conflict in real human terms as it is going on today? In what ways does the devil influence us in our daily activities? What was Satan doing to Emperor Cyrus that was being counteracted by Gabriel and later by Jesus himself? Do we need to worry about the devil having some influence on our lives? Well, every day he every puts, day. there are <clears throat> things that we face that we have to make decisions about, yep. which could be good or bad. Every day, all day long, right? Mm -hmm. Peter says that the devil walks about uh, as a roaring yeah, lion, seeing. seeking whom, whom he may devour. Yeah. So, and, and a specific example was uh, that Jesus told Peter that Satan has demanded that you be sifted by wheat, as wheat, yeah. but I have prayed for you. Yes. So there was, uh, we could say that to, to the extent that we're seeking to do God's will, he's, we're going to be attacked also and okay. sifted as wheat. Okay, I'm going to look at my favorite version now, the New American I mean, I'm sorry, the Good News Bible. And we're going to get some details here so we can try to sort of hone in on where we are in history. In the third year that Cyrus was emperor of Persia, when did Cyrus conquer Babylon? All you historians. 537, wasn't it? No, 539. 539. He conquered Babylon. And so we're now talking about somewhere around 536, 535. A message was revealed to Daniel, who is also called Belteshazzar. And this is another version of the passage that um, Dennis read to us earlier. The message was true, but extremely hard to understand. It was explained to him in a vision. At that time, 
I was mourning for th <coughs> not, not M O R N I N G, but M O U R N I N G for three weeks. I did not eat any rich food or any meat, drink any wine, or comb my hair until the three weeks were past. What was going on there? He was depressed. Well, the, the uh, Jews had returned uh, under Zerubbabel to the Jerusalem, but the reports coming back uh, were not very good. There was opposition there, and so Daniel set out to pray. That's a valid, a very valid assumption. We don't have positive proof that that's what Daniel was praying about, but it was right at the right time, and there's every reason, I think, to suggest. And you can read about that over in the book of Ezra, chapter 4, all the terrible things that was going on, and I'm sure the message must have gotten back to Daniel. He didn't tell us why he was fasting and praying, but by comparing extra-biblical historical evidence, with well, the evidence we have from other biblical sources, we discover that the first group of exiles had just returned to Judah and were being strongly opposed by the local inhabitants. So what happened there, just briefly, from our last quarter, starting about Ezra and Nehemiah? They got back there, and what happened? Almost immediately, who was it that wanted to join them? Sanballat and uh, Tobias. Bias. And they were leading the group of Samaritans largely yeah. and said, yeah, let us just join you, no problem. And what did the Jews say? No. no way. No way. And so what happened to those people who wanted to be so friendly? They became enemies. They, they, did writing, they wrote a letter to, to the king. Yeah. They did everything they could to stop progress. Mm-hmm. And well, they were successful. And they were successful. Daniel was very elderly at that point in time, probably about 90 years old. Was he still working for the Persian government? We just don't know. Cyrus had respected him a great deal a few years earlier. Did Daniel have any personal contact with Cyrus at that point? We don't know. Do you think he tried to influence the emperor himself? That would be interesting to know. Maybe someday we'll be able to find out. It's important to notice that Daniel was not praying for himself. That's clear. Instead, he was praying for the Jewish exiles who were more than a thousand miles away. So why do you think the Bible study guide did not mention the fact that Daniel did not eat any rich food or any meat or drink any wine for a period of three weeks? You'd have to ask them. Conflictive. <laughs> Does this verse seem to contradict the teaching about health that we emphasize in Daniel 1? On oh, that well, we studied in the first part about how yeah. he only had vegetables and... Now, we have to be honest to say that, uh, remember that these young people had grown up eating meat. They ate oh, yeah. part of the sacrifices that were offered at the, when you offered a sacrifice to the temple, you ate part of that sacrifice. So not like they hadn't eaten any meat. And, <clears throat> and all that meat was... Kosher. Kosher. No, no, no. What and I mean is, all <laughs> when they got to Babylon, it was all being offered to false gods. Yeah, right. yeah that's And they true. couldn't bear true to things. eat. Yeah. And the wine Those here mentioned gods. could be pure grape juice. It, grape juice, it doesn't mean that it has to be fermented to, to be this kind of wine. So, did Daniel's prayer affect God in some way? <coughs> How do our prayers affect God? Could we suggest something or some possibility to God that he does not already know about? Well, I think our prayers affect us. Hmm. Gives God the opportunity to act. Okay. Or he would might or, otherwise... Yeah. Or do our prayers allow God to say something to Satan, for example, Move away, Satan. My children are praying for me to do something important here. I am not using excessive force or exercising any means that my human children have not requested. Okay? Is that possible that something like that could happen? Well, in Zechariah 3, where uh, the Joshua the high priest is standing before the Lord, it says and in filthy garments, and the Lord says, to, and Satan is standing by to accuse him, and the Lord says, the Lord, the Lord rebuked even the Lord of hosts. 
So there's our example, right? Another example quoted in our lesson of a time when someone prayed for his associates is in, Daniel, in Job 42, 7 to 10. And let's just look at that very quickly. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you, and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. So Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar did what the Lord had told them to do, and the Lord answered Job's prayer. So now, does this sound like a case where God doesn't want to do something, but he says to Job, well, if you pray for him, then I'll do something? What was really going on here? Well, let me make a suggestion, because this is not primarily about the book of Job. God had stated unequivocally at the very beginning of the story of Job, the part that we know about, that is, that Job would be faithful to him. Mm -hmm. And Job did exactly as God had predicted, because God never makes any mistakes in judging people. God rewarded Job for being faithful, and he tried to teach Job's friends an important lesson. God did not reward Job for praying for his friends. He asked Job to pray for his friends because they had been so wrong in their assessment of Job and God's role in the whole ordeal. Considering what it says in Job 42.11, does it look like Job's family and his friends learned anything? This is probably a verse we should read more often. All of Job's brothers and sisters and former friends came to visit him and feasted with him in his house. They expressed their sympathy and comforted him for all the troubles the Lord had brought on him. Each of them gave him some money and a gold ring. Did Job at that time correct them? Correct their misunderstanding of, of God? I certainly hope so. Well, you could compare it to Peter uh, Satan has demanded that he sift you like wheat, and so mm -hmm. it, it's a similar situation uh, that Satan is sifting Job like wheat, um, but he's doing it with God's permission. So, um. Okay, Daniel 10, verse 12. Then he said, Daniel, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers ever since the first day you decided to humble yourself in order to gain understanding. I have come and answer to your prayer. Do you think that could happen to us today? You bet. Well, we do not know exactly what Daniel was praying for. We've already suggested that maybe it had something to do with what was going on over in Jerusalem. It was not for something that God was not already, uh, for which God was not already aware. Surely the exiles in Judah were also praying for God's assistance. Thus, in the, as in the days of Job, God waited to answer Daniel's prayer until Daniel had proven his faithfulness to the onlooking universe. When Gabriel was sent to answer Daniel's prayer, Satan was primed and ready to fight back. Of what do you think that fight consisted? Was each side trying to do their best to influence Cyrus and whoever else might have been involved in making the decision? Do we experience the temptations of Satan and the guidance of God every day in our lives? Hmm. Jackie? This is Daniel chapter 10, verse 4 to 10. On the 24th day of the first month of the year, I was standing on the bank of the mighty river Tigris. I looked up and saw someone who was wearing linen clothes and a belt of fine gold. His body shone like a jewel. His face was as bright as a flash of lightning, and his eyes blazed like fire. His arms and legs shone like polished bronze, and his voice sounded like the roar of a great crowd. Can I interrupt for just a second? If you look at that description of who talks to him, and then you go over to Revelation 1, guess what you find? A lot of parallel. Almost exactly. Same. And there's one other in the Old Testament where you see this. And same. in Revelation, yeah. And in Revelation 1, it says specifically who it is? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Jackie. I was the only one who saw the vision. 
Those who were with me did not see anything, but they were terrified and ran and hid. I was left there alone, watching this amazing, amazing vision. I had no strength left, and my face was so changed that no one could have recognized me. When I heard his voice, I fell to the ground unconscious and lay there face downwards. Then a hand took hold of me and raised me to my hands and knees. I was still trembling. Yeah, I belong to a runner's club. And Margaret knows about that. And the last few weeks, we have had three people run, running along the road and trip on something, fall flat on their face. Oh, my. And, boy, I mean, you just look at that and you think, oh, no. And you, you, you can't, I can't believe that God does that to people. So what do you think is going on here? God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and with that which he allows. Mm -hmm. So he thinks it's fine for you to fall flat on your face? Not a matter of fine. Life is, is, has its ups and downs, obviously. You just described one of them there. Well, my yeah, question is, yeah. with this, uh, the other people that were with him did not see anything. How, why were they terrified and ran? They must have yeah. heard something. Yeah, they heard something. Yeah. I mean, there was something yeah. there. Yeah. Well, I... I think people are overwhelmed by the glory yeah. in this case, but I, th I think they probably just slowly collapse on the ground. I don't think this is a face plant. Mm -mm. I don't think that represents God in any respect, any sense. Did these people get back right up and keep, keep going? And God helps oh. them back up. Yeah. Well, there's a bright... Oh, you're talking about my friends and... Yeah, they did. They got up with a little bit of help and kept running. Yeah, I've done that once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Acts, uh, when Jesus appears uh, to Paul on the way to Damascus, there's a bright light, and he hears the voice and understands, but the others hear a yeah. sound and they don't, they understand. don't understand. Well, there's a number of other passages, such as Daniel 7:13, Leviticus 16:4, Daniel 8, Joshua 5:13 to 14, and Revelation 1:12 to 18 that clearly present examples of, of humans being approached by supernatural beings. And as we will learn in Daniel 10 through, 10 through 12 over the next three weeks, it seems clear that either Daniel controls human history or he foresees it accurately or both. Either God controls. I'm sorry, God controls, thank you. Do we have evidence that God has acted to control our lives? Mm-hmm. We'll look at a few more verses. Then a hand took hold of me and raised me to my hands and knees. I was still trembling. So who's helping him up now? Jesus. The angel said to me, and we say the word angel here means messenger, so it could be Jesus. Daniel, God loves you. Stand up and listen carefully to what I'm going to say. I have been sent to you. And when he had said this, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, Daniel, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers ever since the first day you decided to humble yourself in order to gain understanding. I have come in answer to your prayer. The angel prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief angels, came to help me because I had been left there alone in Persia. I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the future. This is a vision about the future. <coughs> Excuse me a second. So what do our friends say who don't believe that God can predict the future when it says right there, this is a vision about the future? Yeah. They probably cut that out of their <laughs> dissertation. Cut it out, huh? They certainly ignore it. <laughs> In these verses, we see that God did what he always does when speaking to his prophets. When he first appears to them, they are overwhelmed and often fall face downward on the ground. In Daniel's case, God touched him and raised him to his knees and touched him again, raising him, trembling to his feet. And then God spoke to him and gave him strength. He took hold of his hand and he felt stronger. So now, the big question of this chapter, who is this prince of Persia who resisted the angel for three weeks? Well, it says a prince. If it were Cyrus, you, you would think he would say a king. Yeah. Prince is somebody who 
has a kingdom promise to them or expects or p potentially like they have a couple princes in, so, in uh, England uh, but one falls in there but uh, so a prince could be just somebody under a king some other kind of king like mm -hmm. Satan king okay ruler of this so there's world. two there's two different views about this Prince of Persia, and they could both be right. The Prince of Persia at this day was Cyrus's son, who later became king. His name was Cambyses. And we know from historical documents that Cambyses was very opposed to any other religion except his. And we're going to find out that when the temple, when they stopped, when the building was stopped on the temple in Jerusalem, nothing at all was done during his, Cambyses' entire reign until he, he was replaced by someone else in 522 B.C. So it's possible that these angels were trying to influence Cyrus, who, in, who was being influenced by his son Cambyses. That's a possibility. What are the other possibilities? Prince of Persia may be the devil himself. Yeah. That's why I've always thought who it was. Yeah. So the fact that this Prince of Persia is sort of put in equal competition with an angel and then Jesus himself might want us to say, well, that's more than just Cambyses, right? And think about it. Think about being on the devil's side at this point in time. God's people have been taken off into captivity, some into the captivity under, uh, under the... Um, Assyrians, now others under, in captivity under the ba Babylonians, and now the Persians have come and they've scattered people around here and there. And what is the devil, what is the devil thinking about his success in the great controversy about that point in time? This, well, he's winning. I know, I'm not trying to... I've got it. Winning. Yeah. The devil he's says, winning. I've he got it. He thought he was yeah. just yeah. about there, right? Yeah. And then what happened? He didn't. God sent 50,000 people back to Jerusalem. And devil, the devil must have been very, very upset. But we, we need to remember always that the great controversy is being fought where? Inside human minds. Yes. The great controversy is not open battles with mechanical weapons. It is a battle for the influence and commitment to causes. What should we do if we be become aware of two conflicting systems, each of which seem to make some sense? Margaret? To us, in the common walks of life, heaven may be very near. Desire of Ages, 48. Desire of Ages, yes. Ellen so, White. Desire of Ages, 48, that's oh, talking, ab next. talking about the youth, the young days of Jesus. Do we understand in any way God's foreknowledge? There are many, including many Christians, who do not accept God's foreknowledge because philosophically they believe it would, be, it would destroy human freedom. Why is that? What's the philosophical idea there? Well, if God knows the future, the, uh, he, you have no freedom. Yeah. You're just a... Well, in other words, it's already everything's already yeah, determined. Right, so yeah. God knows it. It's, it's already determined. Is it what they call that? You don't have any Calvinism. Choice. Yeah. Others of us believe that God's foreknowledge is beyond our human understanding. We can't explain it. What a surprise! But that it does not in any way negate our human freedom. Daniel ten thirteen is a very verse specifically speaking specifically about the great controversy, and that's our verse. That this, this is a vision. Well, 14, this is a vision about the future. Right there, it just says so. Okay, Gordon, what's going on here in this conflict? Can we get some clear ideas? These are some thoughts <clears throat> on the use of force. Think about what might be happening here. Which side in the great controversy is more than happy to use force? Would Satan hesitate to try to force Cyrus to choose for his side? Not at all. So God must step in and hold the devil back so Cyrus has some freedom to act. He's balancing the 
over the fulcrum, trying to yeah. equ make it possible for Cyrus to choose for God. How does, that, how does God apply such pressure? How do these battles for the mind actually take place? Will this not become a major ba battlefield and a major issue at the end of time? Will God still restrict himself to the use of truth and evidence, or does he use other weapons? How do we go, how do we go about making decisions? How do the angels seek to influence us for one side or the other? What part does the devil's deception play? Okay, so now there's a lot of questions in there that we could spend a lot of time discussing. Are we going to answer all of them? Of course. No problem. <laughs> well, we all have had this experience. We know about the forces, uh, the forces to tempting us to do evil and God's trying to keep us from doing evil and back and forth and how this all takes place. We have personal experience in this kind of stuff. So let's think about what might have been going on in the case of Cyrus. Well, the people that come into the, uh, his sphere of influence, um, what he thinks of them. Uh, if somebody we know is, um, we think very highly of and we trust their judgment, but then something comes along and says, no, this person is not trustworthy, then that changes our, to some degree, our decision-making process. But it all comes down to making a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, is God, are we going to have a, a good choice? And that might be through influences around us, access to things. Oh, I was going to read my Bible text this morning. And you know how there are days where what you are going to read is just what you needed for that day. You have divine encounters with people mm -hmm. that things just, or you don't, mm -hmm. you know. And those are some of the, the uh, dynamics, I think, that go into yeah. sort of changing what happens around us so that we can make the right choice. Yeah. Well, this vision given to Daniel, recorded over three chapters in Daniel, include events all the way up to and including preparation for the second coming of Jesus. What kind of preparation might we need to be making now for those final events? Myra? I have been shown that many who profess to have the knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there will be men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they have they can give no satisfactory reason. Wow. That's scary. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorances, ignorance. And there are many in the church who will take it granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those like of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain it is that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human in the place of divine wisdom. Wow. It's from the Testimonies from Ellen G. White, Volume 5. Yeah. Compelled to stand singly and alone. Are we prepared for that? Hmm. Well, we would prepare by standing alone uh, personally in our daily lives and, and have some, some exercise, some yeah. spiritual exercise in doing so, but if we're always hiding behind... Uh, other people and other champions, and then suddenly we're left by ourselves. We may not have the strength. So maybe we need times in Sabbath school classes or th places like that where we ask someone who isn't normally the teacher, stand up and explain to us why you keep the Sabbath. Explain to us what you think about the sanctuary program. Well, what would happen if we tried that? 
That would be one, uh, you know, practice exercise. But if you're out in the workplace or some, and you know somebody uh, like Jim does, he goes out golfing and he, people ask him questions. Mm -hmm. He responds and all of that sort of builds up faith, builds up uh, an understanding because there are blind spots in, in our own thinking. We just don't know everything. Well, there are many Christians, including some Seventh-day Adventists, who suggest that we don't need to evaluate the evidence and suggest that we, we should just ask the Holy Spirit. What will happen to those people who are now saying we do not have to take time to evaluate all the evidence? Sounds will like it, a great idea to ask the Holy Spirit, and we should. But, as you say, will we it be still safe need to evaluate to the evidence. Yeah, will it be safe just to wait for the Holy Spirit to guide us? Well, don't you think you kind of have to spend time with the Spirit so that you know the Spirit? Wow, what an idea. <laughs> and the Spirit has to have something to draw on, you know, the texts of Scripture and things, you know, bring things to mind about uh, what God has done for us and all of those things. And if they're not there in our head... Uh, is, is it possible if you prayed that to the Holy Spirit, the devil might try to answer? Sure. <laughs> yes, if you're not used to... If you're not uh, used to talking? To know the voice, you know, she when, says we ought to know his okay. voice. When we discuss the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to remember that his major contribution to us has been the giving of oh, the that's, scriptures. That's right. Those are what we need to be studying to learn from the Holy Spirit. I could give you lots of quotations, even from the Bible and from Ellen White, to support that. Well, John 6, 63, yeah. the words I have spoken are spirit and life. That's Jesus yeah. talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if, it's, if it, Jesus didn't say it, it's probably not w w worth a whole lot of time thrashing about it. So what do we know about this battle going on over the decision to allow the exiles to continue with their work? What was the result of Daniel's prayer and God's intercession? What great honor was shown to Daniel by the majesty of heaven. He comforts his trembling servant and assures him that his prayer was heard in heaven. And that in answer to that fervent petition, the angel Gabriel was sent to affect the heart of the Persian king. Cyrus, the Persian monarch, had resisted the impressions of the Spirit of God during the three weeks while Daniel was fasting and praying. But heaven's prince, the archangel Michael was sent to turn the heart of the stubborn king to take some decided action to answer the prayer of Daniel. Ellen White, Review and Herald, 1881. Okay. And other quotes and references after that. Okay. Well, now let me read Daniel 10, 12, and 13. Then he said, Daniel, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers. Ever since the first day you decide to humble yourselves in order to gain understanding, I have come to answer, I have, I have come in answer to your prayer. The angel prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief angels, came to help me because I had been left there alone in Persia. Just to re reiterate the verses we're talking about. And Carrie, I think you have something about that. Yes, by this we see that heavenly agencies have to contend with hindrances before the purpose of God is fulfilled in its time. The king of Persia was controlled by the highest of all evil angels. He refused, as did Pharaoh, to obey the word of the Lord. Gabriel declared, He withstood me twenty-one days by his representations against the Jews. Let me interrupt for there just a second. We have that part highlighted in our se section, so is it pretty clear there about who is trying to influence Cyrus? Yeah. yeah. The king of Persia was controlled by the highest of all evil angels. That should sort of settle that, shouldn't it? So the prince mm -hmm. of Persia was the devil. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. <coughs> Michael came to his help, and then he remained with the kings of Persia, holding the powers in check, giving right counsel against evil counsel. Good and evil angels are taking a part in the planning of God in his earthly kingdom. 
it is God's purpose to carry forward his work in correct lines, in ways that will advance his glory. But Satan is ever trying to counterwork God's purpose. Only by humbling themselves before God can God's servants advance his work. Never are they to depend on their own efforts or on outward display for success. Wow. It came from Manuscript, manuscript Releases, Volume 1199. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. They, uh, the Ellen White Estates, after a lot of discussion and so forth like this and realizing how much interest there was in the subject, has taken basically everything left that what hasn't been put in a book somewhere okay. and put it together in a collection and there's actually 20 volumes of those, oh. those statements. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Daniel 10 through 12 took place around 536 B.C., the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. The first exiles had just returned to their homeland, read about that in Ezra 2, and had attempted to rebuild the temple. Apparently an insurmountable mountain of opposition arose. And we've talked earlier about the Samaritans. First of all, the exiles had to travel hundreds of miles through territory of potential enemies to reach Palestine. They were carrying many things, including most of their personal belongings, plus amounts of gold and silver that today would be worth about $26,510,000. Wow. $26.5 million they were carrying. Then when the Samaritans were refused participation in the building of the temple, they became bitter enemies. They managed to write a letter to the emperor which resulted in the halting of construction. You can read about that in Ezra 4, 6-16 and 23-24. We do not know exactly at what point this whole rebuilding process, Daniel began his three weeks of fasting and prayer. So stop and think of Satan's position for a moment. He had managed to scatter the children of Israel throughout the Babylonian and Persian empires. He must have thought that he was just about to win the great controversy because these people would eventually melt into their surroundings and completely forget God. Then suddenly God led a big group of them home to Palestine. Satan must have been furious and this was his response. At such a critical time in history, is there any surprise that Jesus himself, referred to as Michael the Archangel, stepped in to make sure that God's plans were not defeated? What do you think? Well, yeah. Certainly would seem appropriate, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As described in these verses we've read so far in Daniel 10, he fought the evil prince of Persia. Is there any question about who that is? Mm -hmm. Well, we just read about it in the yeah. quotation, didn't we? We know that the devil is fully aware that his time is coming to an end. His time is coming to an end. The only way he can extend his life is by getting us to delay our preparation for the second coming. Hmm. How often do we think about how closely... What? Never, I never ever thought of that. Yeah. How often do we think about how closely heaven is tied to earth? Do we think each day about how our lives might be impacted by supernatural forces? Try to imagine you are in counsel with the devil's counsel as 50,000 exiles move successfully from exile in Babylonia, and Babylonia, we should say Persia, and elsewhere back to the land of Palestine. What do you suppose they were saying? We gotta kill these people. Yeah. What kind of opposition are we going to get? Who can we get to? How do we oppose God here? Satan must have been exceedingly disappointed, but he realized that if there was some way to prevent them from regaining a foothold, he might still succeed in his plan to destroy God's people. So do you think it is possible that a human king, Cyrus, left by himself, could offer significant opposition to a supernatural being? Probably not what we're talking about here, right? <clears throat> Look at Daniel 10, 20 and 21. He said, do you know why I came to you? It is to reveal to you what is written in the book of truth. Now I have to go back and fight the guardian angel of Persia. That would be this evil 
angel of Persia. After that, the guardian angel of Greece will appear. There is no one to help me except Michael, Israel's guardian angel. So, that translation suggests that each one of these countries has a major power trying to work with them, right? I think Ellen White says that even, well, heavenly beings are organized and everything, and I suspect Satan follows that uh, as much as he can as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's a chance for us to learn a word that, or you probably all know already, but it's a word that I have learned fairly recently. This opposition against the powers of God, which are not from a human source, but from a supernatural source, but an evil source, they call, are called preternatural, not supernatural, but preternatural. That is, supernatural, but evil. Mm. Agents who are doing everything they can to convince Cyrus to stop the Jews from rebuilding the temple. Look at Ezekiel 28, uh, and we know about this. this. The Lord spoke to me, mortal man, he said, grieve for the faith that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You are once an example of perfection, and you know the rest of the stuff. And who's it talking about there? Satan. Exactly. And, and no human being was walking around in the, in, in the Garden of Eden and so forth. Clearly, the king of Tyre was only a human agent, while the real enemy was Satan himself. While we cannot, in our human understanding, fully comprehend what was going on between Satan and Christ, in their efforts to influence the thinking of Cyrus, it must have been a real battle. The most, this is from the Adult, Bible, uh, Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide from Thursday, March 12. The most prominent character in the book of Daniel is the figure initially called Son of Man in 713, or Prince of the Host, 811. Eventually we learn that his name is Michael, uh, Daniel 10, uh, 21, which means who is like God. He comes to help Gabriel in the conflict with the king of <coughs> Persia, uh, 1013. The angel refers to this heavenly being as Michael, your prince, 1021, uh, namely the prince of God's people. Michael appears later in the book of Daniel as the one who stands for God's people, 121. From Jude 9, we learn that Michael was called an archangel, fights, uh, also called an archangel, fights against Satan and resurrects Moses. Revelation 12, 7 reveals that Michael stands as the leader of a heavenly army which defeats Satan and his fallen angels. Thus, Michael is none other than Jesus Christ. As the Persian Empire has a supreme commander, a, a, a spiritual force who stands behind its human leader, so God's people have Michael, their commander-in-chief, who steps into fight and wins the cosmic war on their behalf. Wow, that's quite a presentation. So um, let me just pick out a couple of spots that we need to just review in case some of you out there have maybe not reviewed these recently. Revelation 12, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and all his angels with him. So I think it's pretty hard for it to make it any clearer that, but who, who's who on the, the, the two sides of this great conflict. And we goes on and talks about how uh, this person is doing everything he can to misrepresent God's people. The accuser of the brethren, as he's sometimes called. Are we surrounded by both good and evil angels at all times? Yeah. Yeah. Do the devil's angels come to our Sabbath school classes? Mm. Yes. Oh, dear. Probably, yes. Well, we got, what, First Peter 5, 8? 
Mm -hmm. The devil goes around like a roaring lion. Then, uh, was it Ephesians 6, 12? Rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So okay. We have not only the evil angels, but good angels there. All right. Yes. Balancing so that we can make decisions. Okay. Well, it depends on, they may come in with a, per, a particular person or many persons. So nice. I think the balance may come down to how many influences you have for good or for evil present at that particular day. That's one, one factor. There's no question about it. But let's think about that for just a moment. Um, is there any way we can influence how many good and how many evil angels can be, are, are present? Well, and we while can you pray. Oh, yeah, we, we can, can pray. pray. Let me think about, let me just thought, think about something else. I, we don't want to get too good at practicing thinking like the devil. But if you were in charge of the devil's forces today, where would you want to exert the maximum amount of your influence? The leaders of God's church. And anybody who's trying to study about the truth, right? You, don't, you want to keep those Bibles slammed shut. You don't want anybody open there and trying to figure out what's going on. Right? Or bring them along, even. Or even bring them along, yeah. Or let them read translations that need, need correcting. Yeah. Or let them read translations that they can't understand. Well, yeah. yeah. Very much. That does are in the Holy old Spirit, English. Does the Holy Spirit ever suggest that we can pray and that will substitute for careful study of the truth and evidence? If the Holy Spirit has spent thousands of years now trying to prepare, inspire, get copied, et cetera, et cetera, translated Bible so that we can use them, we can, we can read them and studying them, would he say, well, you don't need to bother yourself with reading that material. It doesn't really matter. No. I mean, wouldn't that be just foolish? Even on television, people talk about praying for the Holy Spirit to guide them. Then they teach things which we consider to be very wrong. How should we feel about that? Call them out. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good idea. You're going to have to do it quietly because they're not going to listen. Yeah. They, they just pay attention to where the money's coming from. The use of reason scares many religious people. What is the role of reason in religion today? Is our own reason a trustworthy tool in studying scripture? In 1870, the Roman Catholic Church declared that the Pope speaking ex cathedra was infallible. Think of all the preparation that goes into the presentation of an ex cathedra statement from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we have serious considerations when we look at those documents, but there's no question about they spent a lot of time and careful thinking saying what they believe is the truth. The Pope carefully meets with his advisors and counselors and spends a lot of time. And Protestants say, oh, no, no, human being is infallible. But Protestants in some cases seem to be suggesting that when, when they pray and the Holy Spirit guides them, they're infallible, acting on their own without any other human assistance. Is that a reliable thing to do? Jackie? I think you got something to say there. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. He made a public, public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory procession. How did he do that? He raised from the dead. Okay, and that... <laughs> And that did what? Well, it broke the power of death over humanity. It, he Let, broke the power yeah. of Satan. Let's, let's talk about three things very quickly because we're running out of time. There are three things that Satan wanted to accomplish when Jesus came to this earth. First of all, he says, no human being has lived on this earth without sinning. I'm going to get this kid to sin. Mm -hmm. He failed. He gotten in his ministry, and Jesus got was getting closer and closer to 
to the end of his life. And Satan said, okay, if I can't get him to sin, I'm going to make things so difficult and people so stubborn and, and listening to him and so forth that he'll just say it's not worth it and give up and go back to heaven. Doesn't have to sin, just leave these people. Finally, when he failed with that and Christ is dead on the cross and he's buried in the tomb, Satan says to his friends and all his evil angels, we have to keep that grave shut. Mm -hmm. Further up the page in uh, Colossians 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. Yeah. So there's okay. that contrast between the two. So we know that two angels came down from heaven. Ellen White pictures it. One rolled back the stone and the other one simply said, your father calls you. And Jesus came forth from the tomb in his own divine power. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah is right. <laughs> and we talk about the hundred soldiers are lying flat on the ground. That was nothing. Think about the millions of evil angels that oh, got scattered yeah. before he got to the hundred soldiers. Yeah. Hallelujah is right. Well, the life and death of Jesus leave us a clear choice. We can choose to follow him and live lives following the example of his life or we, we will die the kind of death he died separated from God, the only source of life. Jesus faced Satan in his most fierce temptations. God protected him from being killed as an infant by sending him to Egypt. When he began his ministry, Jesus faced Satan in those terrible temptations at the end of that 40 days of fasting and prayer. He repeatedly cast out demons, releasing people from their demonic hold. He recognized the de devil even when the devil was speaking through Peter, suggesting he should not go to Calvary, Matthew 16. Jesus himself, during his last day of, in, in temple in Jerusalem, broadened the plan of salvation to include the entire universe. Notice how Ellen White comments. Margaret? All right. But the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when he just before his crucifixion, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. That's John 12, 31 and 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. This is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, paragraph 2 to 69, paragraph 1. Anyway. Zero, the, the well, yeah. part of a paragraph at the top. Wow, what a statement. How much information did Jesus as a human being have about his future death before it happened? Did Jesus ever observe a crucifixion so that he might have some idea about what was coming? Probably. It might seem like a simple task, choose Satan's side or choose God's side, but if we choose to walk the walk, then it needs to be a daily experience, every day learning more about Jesus and how he can serve him, how we can serve him. If we do make that commitment, then we have this promise, from Romans 8:37 to 39 no in all things these things we have complete victory through him who loved us for i am certain that nothing can separate us from his love neither death nor life neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers present the other Neither, neither the, the present nor the future. Yeah. Okay, there it is, yes. Neither the world above nor the world below, 
There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, Though we are not the first people in Christian history to see this truth as Seventh-day Adventists, we are strong proponents of the great controversy motif, or the idea that the entire universe is part of an epic struggle between Christ and Satan, and we believe that every human being is, indeed, involved in this controversy. Others, even secular people, have talked about the reality of some kind of battle in which we are all immersed. What has been your experience in the great controversy? How have you seen it manifest in your own life? What have you learned that could help others struggling as well? John Milton's Paradise Lost is something well familiar to many Adventists and other Christians um, and other places. Um, there's some very interesting stuff if you actually do some research, but nobody has come even close to presenting it the way Ellen White has. Paul suggested a certain amount of armor is needed. Remember Ephesians 6. Most of us live busy lives without obvious human enemies. We may have difficulty at times, at home, or at work, but we don't think about these people that we sometimes have problems with as real enemies. Are we trying to live the kind of lives that would represent Jesus correctly to all those around us? Uh, or must we, uh, does Jesus fight for us even if we do not ask him to? Or must we ask in order to get his assistance? If God fought for us without our asking, would the devil cry foul? How much do you suppose Daniel understood about the great controversy and its implications? He clearly understood the situation of the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Persians. Those were groups with which he was quite familiar. But what about the forces behind the scenes? Through Daniel, God chose to give us a picture of what is happening behind the scenes. We've talked quite a bit about the Tsar, the prince. Uh, we've talked about the possibility that it could be Cambyses, or probably more likely it was the devil himself trying to prevent uh, these people from doing what was right. We're not used to think, we are not used to, think, to thinking of being in constant danger of war. But in ancient times, the children of Israel were constantly at risk of being attacked by a nearby enemy. So then what was very important in God's, was that to be the fact that God was a mighty, mighty warrior, mighty, mighty in battle. And you know about those passages if you studied your Old Testament. So think about these issues yourself. Our kind and loving Father. What a privilege it is to study these things and to think about all the implications. To remember that we are in the midst of the greatest battle of all times. We sometimes read about wars that are going on in this earth and we think how terrible, how awful. But do we remember that the mightiest of all wars is going on in our minds, in our thoughts every day? Help us to, re to realize more than we have before the implications of that battle is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.